As you can see, I've managed to separate it from the main unit. This is the amplifier and tuner section. To separate it from the main unit, simply undo some screws. There's a screw there, a screw there, and a screw there on each side. And that will undo the main brackets from the main unit. And you don't have to deal with the hinges at all. And after you get the bottom plastics off, you can access the front panel. That's held on with a, a multitude of screws. Okay, onto the circuitry. You have a power transformer there. You have a rectification and filtering board. Nothing fancy going on here at all. It does need to be recapped. These seals have gotten hard and you can see they're starting to bulge on the end. That's bad for long-term reliability. If those fail, it could take out the power supply and ruin the unit. There's the FMIF section or intermediate frequency section. This is a super heterodyne radio. There's the FM and AM front end and down in there it's gonna, gonna be hard to see. A little white device down there with three leads on it. If I can get a good picture of it, I'm not sure if I can or not. It's in, it's in, in between those three resistors and that coil there. That's the FET in the uh, FM front end that they were bragging about on the front panel. It's probably the most advanced semiconductor in the entire unit. I can't really see what it is. 920 something. It's a, definitely an interesting package. They still actually make transistors in that package. You have two AM gangs and three FM gangs on the variable capacitor. And like all very caps, they move in and out like this to tune them. Now going down the dial and increasing the capacitance, which lowers the resonant frequency. We're now at the lower end extreme of the dial, and now we're going back up and raising the frequency and lowering the capacitance. And this is what it looks like when you're at the top of the dial. There's the wafer switch for the input selector. What's interesting about this is the uh, contacts aren't freely floating out there. You can't see them. They're wedged in between another wafer that moves. There's still a big enough gap that you can get some deoxid in there and how you clean them is pretty simple. Get your deoxid. Just get in there where the wafer is. and spray a small quantity. Not much. So you just kind of want to bubble it down in there. And then rotate the controls back and forth quickly several times to distribute the cleaner. This one wasn't really dirty. It doesn't need to be three-step cleaned. I'm just doing this as a preventative measure. But that is how you run the oxit on a selector switch. I've shown this before, but uh, it is pretty popular, so I'll show it again. Uh, how you do it on a pot is pretty simple. The active element on the pot is actually on this little circuit board that's inside the pot, so you want to make sure you spray that area and not spray into the back. So to get into a pot, you just go go to the other side spray it a little bit note that this is a dual section pot so we've got to spray the lower half there it focuses finally and then once you get a shot in there you just rotate the control back and forth can see the wiper contacts in there. Make sure those are covered, make sure those are soaked in deoxid when they go past. Those are what are actually contacting the active area of the pot and making the connection and doing the adjustment for you. You can see the wipers move back and forth as I rotate the controls back and forth.
Transistors are a, at least a mix of, if not all, germanium, uh, a mix of silicon and germanium. I suspect the TO92 packages in black there are silicon, and the TO5 in metal is germanium. All the transistors over here on the output stage are germanium. They're 2SB473, and I suspected uh, they were germanium because 2SB means P and P, and they're all P and P, so that should immediately tip you off that this is not silicon. The output stage is coupled to the drive stage via transformers. That's not done anymore, but that is typical of germanium circuits. It does seem to be quite a bit more advanced, though, than other germanium amplifiers that have graced the bench. It's certainly a better and fancier circuit than what you'd find in, say, a Magnavox Astrosonic. It's not as powerful, but I think it's better. It certainly does sound better. Uh, a lot less just weird sounds. It, it, this one sounds much more neutral, which is good. Progress was made between 1964 and when this was made. I'm not real sure when this was made. Probably somewhere in between the years of 68 and 72. Uh, it's a pretty narrow range. Anything later than 72, and it would be all silicon most likely. Anything earlier than that, and we'd see bigger transistors and bigger parts. It, there's a bit too much miniaturization for it to be too much older than 68. But anyway, that's all there is to this unit. A, f a few boards and uh, a lot of open space. If they'd had modern silicon, they could have definitely turned this into a powerhouse if they'd wanted to. Um, but you know, I could put a nice big transformer there. Put some nice power boards down there, maybe some heat sinking. But the only heat sinking here is this little bracket that leads to the chassis. And that's all it needs because it's not a powerful amplifier. It's only a few watts per channel, uh, which is enough for background music in most rooms. Uh, it does come with its own set of speakers. I do need to warn you, again, don't put other speakers with this unit. It wants 16 ohm speakers, and I suspect the amplifier won't be very happy with you if you add 8 ohm speakers. It might overheat, and that will void your warranty, and since it's germanium, it would be kind of expensive to fix. Might be able to adapt it to silicon, but ugh, let's not go there. We'll just use the proper speakers. Capacitors are in decent shape on these boards, at least it seems. Uh, if you want it, I may consider recapping it if I can get enough caps. I'll have to see what values they are and see if I've got them in stock. If I end up recapping it, I'll give you guys a deal. Uh, I'll only charge 20 bucks to recap it. I'm already taking it apart for cleaning, and I had to get it apart this far just to get the front panel off to clean it, so there isn't a whole lot of labor involved in recapping it. Probably. 30 to 45 minutes of actual service labor and maybe 10 to 15 dollars in parts so there's your chance to get a nice uh, cool looking conversation piece that won't uh, have any trouble at all you'll always be able to turn it on and go hey look at this uh, look at my cool vintage stereo here that said it is like I said it's not a critical listening room type piece it's it's a more of a conversation piece a, just a it's a novelty item um, and that's one of the reasons it's inexpensive and one of the reasons I'm telling everybody because I'm known for gear that's fairly high end and this is not high end gear but it's weird and wacky and cool so it gets a chance to go through the shop even though it is a multiplex unit and I usually uh, do not repair multiplex units I I usually do not like them, but I've taken a bit of a fondness to this one. Uh, it's got a nice, clean, simple circuit layout. It's well designed, and it's cool. So, anyway, I'm going to get to cleaning up the panels, which are the main offenders of this unit. They just, they just look bad. Uh, I'm going to clean them up and then put it back together and check out uh, the possibility of recapping this unit. Okay. That's about enough for this. I uh, will see y'all in a bit.